Good evening. Today is the 29th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Today's celebrant is Father Scott Whitfield. The Mass intentions for today are for Primo Giannotti. Please silent all cell phones. Thank you. The Mass is beginning. Please stand. All of our hymns this evening can be found in the glory and praise. Please join in singing 686. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And with your spirit. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins, and so prepare to celebrate the sacred mysteries. Almighty God, have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life.
let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, grant that we may always conform our will to yours and serve your majesty in sincerity of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. It was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. The word of the Lord. Please join number 196. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. 
the word of the Lord. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. To you, o Lord. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to Jesus and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And Jesus said to them, What is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink. With the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. There's this old TV show I watched when I was a kid. I think you can still catch it on some channels. It was The Twilight Zone. Anybody remember that one? The Twilight Zone? A few people recognize that. They got some hands up there. It was a great show. It was an anthology that was, every episode was a standalone, its own discreet little story. It didn't depend on what came the week before or the week after. And the episodes, well, they kind of had a sci-fi kind of feel to them, psychological horror, perhaps you might say. They were modern fables, parables, tragedies. And for most of the seasons, I think they were all just done in 24 minutes. I know an episode came to mind when I read today's gospel, particularly the latter half, as Jesus begins to talk about servant and serving and the connection I made with this particular episode, let's say it's about misunderstanding or perhaps willful or wishful misunderstanding. So some of you may know it. it was the episode about space aliens who land on Earth and they say they come in peace and they give to humanity technology that ends worldwide hunger. They provide an inexhaustible source of energy for us and so on. All these wonderful things they give to us and they do it just as a gift. Just here you are. Now, they're a funny kind of creature. They speak telepathically, so mind to mind. So everyone understands them in their own human language, but the alien's language itself is beyond comprehension. Now, after a meeting at the United Nations, one of the aliens absentmindedly leaves a book behind. Now, there's a linguist, a 
a student of language, a, a professor of language, and he wants to learn their language. But when he gets the book, he and other experts look at it and they can't make any sense of it. Nonetheless, he and his assistant set themselves to deciphering the book. And part of his motivation is that, well, he's a little suspicious. This is all too good to be true. Now, in the meantime, the aliens offer to anyone who wants to go a free trip to their homeworld, which they describe as a paradise. And people sign up for this, not in the thousands, in the millions, to travel there. Now, a year later, after a lot of his own friends have gone off on the alien spaceships, he finally cracks at least the problem insofar as now he can translate the book's title. And the title is To Serve Man. Forgive us, it's not Serve Humanity. It's the 1960s when the show was made. It was To Serve Man. Well, what do you know, he thinks. These are really, really nice aliens. He shouldn't have been so suspicious. Now he figures he should go to their world, learn their language there. So he gets his ticket, packs his bags, heads to the airport. Well, his assistant, she thinks she can probably work out more of the book. So she does some more translating. And then suddenly there's this flash of realization. She jumps up out of her desk, rushes from the lab. And the scene cuts to where the linguist is happily going up the spaceship's boarding ramp when he hears his assistant yelling from the other side of the boarding gate. And he looks at her and says, oh, what's wrong? And just as he's being hustled on board, she shouts, to serve man. It's a cookbook. Does everybody remember that episode, those who saw it? The episode itself is kind of middling, but the payoff at the end is fantastic. I was reminded of that story because of what Jesus says. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. Do we understand what he is saying? Do we understand it objectively? Do we understand it with the meaning he intended or with the meaning we prefer? No, we get that he didn't come to be waited on, to be pampered and attended like some fat Roman emperor on a couch with a slave fanning him. He came to us to get something done that would be of incredible service to us. So, is he our servant? Can we just boss him around? Is he to serve whatever we think is worthy of our time and attention? Is he to bless whatever we think is good and righteous? At the end of our days, is he there to hold the gates open for us to saunter into heaven? At the resurrection, is he to rush around dusting us all off as our bodies rise from the grave? Now, that might strike some of you as a ridiculous set of questions, but honestly, look around at what has become of so much of the church, so many of the different denominational churches. You know, they're all about these causes, and they advertise them with the signs they put out on the lawns about this cause and that cause and this social justice issue and this other issue. And it strikes me as odd because it reminds me again of this scripture when we read about James and John looking to be seated next to the Lord. You know, they're seeking after the prestige of being close to him. And perhaps it is innocently enough asked for, but there's a tremendous temptation in taking that place. Because everyone sees and understands that you stand so close to authority that there is power in that. And can you discipline yourself enough to resist the temptations that come with that? You know, when we consider the great mystical tradition of the church, of people like St. Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, St. Francis, St. Catherine of Siena, we don't find them concerned so much with the political issues of the day, although they address them in some indirect manner, but first and foremost with how we can grow closer to God as the first step in knowing what God asks of us in the living of our lives. We get this so backward. Regarding the causes we see as just and right as the source of our faith and evidence of our righteousness, we look to Christ to serve our cause, not for us to serve him in the cause of our salvation. Let's be clear. Jesus came to serve God's plan, not our plans. This backwardness needs to be considered, especially in light of 
the Pope's recent call to synodality, this global consultation that he's initiated lately, that will culminate in a couple of years with some kind of grand summation of the conversation all one billion Catholics are supposed to have in the next 24 months. I would warn in everyone that if what is achieved looks more like a political party's election platform than a deep consideration of our relationship with God and how to find our way back to him, then the process will have gone badly wrong. Then we will have mistaken a human consensus for the divine will, politicking for the work of the Holy Spirit. Well, let's get back to that cookbook. Because the theme of food runs throughout Scripture. Jesus is famous for feeding people. You know the multiplying of fish and loaves. But we understand that he feeds us spiritually, that God feeds us spiritually. The manna in the desert, again, another metaphor for how God gives us the nutrition by which our soul grows, our spirit develops. There's that idea of spiritual food that is for us. And then there's us as food, the threat of our being devoured. St. Peter tells us in a letter that you can find in your Bibles, discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. I know Jesus said that he did not come to be served, but I think we know he is served, served up to us in the Eucharist. You know, in a few minutes after I finish speaking, I will be laying the altar to consecrate hosts, making of them the sacrament of his most holy body and blood, and then, well, I'll be serving them to you in the communion rite. We speak of the Eucharist as the holy sacrifice of the altar, but also as the Lord's Supper. Take this, all of you, eat of it. This is my body which will be given up for you. So, well, welcome to the Mass. I will be your server this evening, and I recommend the chef's specialty, the Eucharist. Jesus' service to us is to have himself served to us. Jesus served us by his sacrifice for our sins. He gave himself, offered himself up for our ultimate good to save us, redeem us, give us a way to live forever, forever together with God. And by that, he serves God's plan. It's the kind of service we are called to offer, to serve others by serving out ourselves, giving of ourselves for the good of others. If we're really truly devoted to Jesus, that could mean giving everything, just as he gave everything, including his life. So as with anyone eating something for the first time, anyone intrigued by the chef's special, one will ask, well, what's in it? We speak of the Eucharist being his body and blood. We're talking about his substance, his divine substance. To take and to eat is to take God within us and potentially allow God to transform us, to grow us in spirit and in truth. You know, eat your greens. Finish your porridge. Enjoy a nice piece of fish. Those things are the material from which our bodies physically grow and we are made healthy and strong. To grow spiritually, we must take in God first through his holy word. We've got to read scripture. At the mass, it's kind of like the appetizer. But you know, you can snack on that word all week. Does everyone here have a Bible? Do we read it? You know, you can put it on your phone now on your devices. You can even get apps that help you read it, dividing it up into nice bite-sized chunks. St. Jerome, the great doctor of the church, wrote that ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ himself. So if we don't know our Bible, we'll never make sense of Jesus' teaching. Jesus, we say, is the word incarnate, the word made flesh. If we don't start with scripture, we'll never develop our palate. We won't develop a taste for the goodness of the Eucharist. Now, I mention all this because, you know, this weekend is going to be special for a lot of children who will receive the Eucharist for the first time. And I pray that they will come to see the Eucharist as the most important meal, more important than breakfast. To make it the most important meal of the week is to get yourself properly set for life, to set your priorities straight. 
is to confess by the act of communion that I literally want God in my life. I want him in me, part of me, or rather me to be part of him. Christian initiation into the church is not baptism and confirmation. To be fully a member of the church is to receive baptism, confirmation, and to partake of the Eucharist regularly. To allow Jesus to be served to you so that you may serve him. You need them. Now we're talking about eating. Let's consider the shape we're all in. What's our diet like? I think many of you might be aware that what is described as the real health crisis in North America, no, it's not that. It's obesity. And it's not infrequently resulting in diabetes, which is a tremendous problem. According to the World Health Organization, more than a billion people around the world are overweight, with most of them most likely to become obese. Obesity remains the greatest health concern in North America, with more than half the population at risk of developing obesity. Obesity remains at an all-time high in North America. Close to three-fourths of the combined Canadian, American, and Canadian populations are overweight. We eat too much. We eat too much of the wrong thing. We eat too much and do too little. Too much time sitting around, well, bored, in some cases intoxicated, often overstuffed with junk food. And spiritually, we eat too much of the wrong thing. I continue to be appalled by what is now popular entertainment, the situation comedies on television networks that, for example, they normalize sexual promiscuity by making all just a lot of fun antics, something that we all laugh at, something to not take seriously. It's a powerful suggestion to many that they can treat their lives like a soap opera, like a lightweight comedy. We all know drama queens and clowns. And many of those wind up in my office asking me why God is punishing them. Most don't ever even think to come to see me or my colleagues. But you know, God's not punishing them. They become spiritually obese, out of shape, their souls struggle to breathe. That's why they're in such distress. The culture that is serving you now, the one that offers up on a platter all these distractions, all these things to watch, to consume, that makes it so easy to get the junk food of the mind, the empty spiritual calories by having it a click away on your computer or a swipe away on your phone. Think hard in what it is serving you and what, or rather, is really being served up. Because it's not what's being served up, it's who's being served up, and it's you who's on the menu. You know what social media is? Oh, it's a way to keep up with friends, with trends, with news and views? Well, no, that's not its service. Its service, how it makes money for the tech billionaires, is that it serves you up to advertisers and marketers. By your clicks, it learns how to prepare you for the messaging and marketing to steer you to products, services, yes, to political parties and candidates, causes and movements. It's also molding your desires and appetites, creating fear, inculcating attitudes about the world around you so that you want more and more of the junk, that they are more than prepared to keep cooking up for you and pouring into the feeding troughs on your phones, your pads, and your laptops. Now, I know you can't listen to everyone. You can't read every book. There's lots of food in the world, and you can't taste it all to see if you like it or if it's good for you. We all tend to filter out options in terms of our reading, our viewing, our listening, eating, and drinking based on, well, frankly, the opinions of others. Others whom you trust. Someone you trust will tell you that a particular writer is terrible, so you never open his book. A friend with whom you sit around listening to music with tells you a singer is just garbage, so you never give her a listen. And then there's just not knowing if something is good or not because you've never tried it and you don't know anyone who has, so you stay away. Now, it's fair to say a lot of people don't know me. So, with regard to the Eucharist, with regard to the Word of God, don't take my word for it. Now, whose reviews would you trust? Whose invitation to the Eucharist would you accept? St. Therese de Lisieux, the little flower, wrote, Receive communion often, very often. There you have the sole remedy if you want to be cured. Our parish patron, St. Augustine, wrote, He who is all-knowing knew of nothing more than he could give than the Eucharist. 
He who is all-powerful could not do any more than he does in the sacrament, and he who is all-loving had nothing more than that he could give the Eucharist as a divine storehouse filled with every virtue. Mother Teresa of Calcutta, saint of the church, said Jesus has made himself the bread of life to give us life. Night and day he is there. If you really want to grow in love, come back to the Eucharist. Well, there you go. So shortly, dinner will be served. Amen. Let us now stand and confess our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. As we await with longing the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, let us with renewed devotion beseech his mercy that as he came into the world to bring good news to the poor and to heal the contrite of heart, so in our own time also he may bring salvation to all in need. For God's holy church, that it may be a light to the nations and the universal sacrament of salvation, walking with all people to the kingdom of God, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For Francis, our Pope, D Douglas and Wayne, our bishops, and the holy faithful, people of God in Hamilton Diocese, that the celebration of the Synod may help us to discern God's will and to boldly carry it out, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all civil and public authorities, that they may always seek the common good acting with justice and integrity, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the sick, the lonely, the oppressed, and the suffering, that they may never be discarded, but rather treasured and cared for as the face of Christ in a suffering world, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For ourselves gathered here, that the synodal process may lead us ever deeper into the communion of the church, foster our participation in it, and equip us to go out in mission, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the children in our parish receiving the sacrament of First Holy Communion this weekend, and the catechists and teachers who prepared them, that God bless them and bestow upon them the gifts they need for happiness and salvation, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our dearly departed, especially Primo Giannotti, may the Lord grant them mercy, forgiveness, and full blessings in heaven, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. O God, our refuge and our strength, hear our pray the prayers of your church. For you yourself are the source of all devotion. And grant, we pray, that what we ask in faith we may truly obtain through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our offertory is number 577. Share my 
Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept the sacrifice at your hands, the praise and glory of his name, for good and the good of all his holy church. Grant us, Lord, we pray, a sincere respect for your gifts, that through the purifying action of your grace, we may be cleansed by the very mysteries we serve through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death. And by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory, as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread. And giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice. And once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me.
the mystery of Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church, spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity. Together with Francis, our Pope, Douglas, our Bishop, and Wayne, our Auxiliary Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. May this mingle by the blood of Jesus Christ be eternal life to us who receive it. Thank you. 
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. a gentle reminder that at communion those who wish to receive upon the tongue must receive last uh, that will follow uh, communion being taken to those who receive in the pews so the communion rite those in the pews and the end of the communion rite those who wish to receive on the tongue please come forward I'll wait for you at the top of the center aisle our communion hymn will be five two four in the glory and praise.
Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that by benefiting from participation in heavenly things, we may be helped by what you give in this present age and prepared for the gifts that are eternal. Through Christ our Lord. So just by way of announcements, a couple of appeals. One is if anyone has an old cell phone, uh, we have someone that who would really benefit from having that. If you can, if you can give it to us, the SIM card removed and any data wiped off it, uh, and you're not doing anything with it, it would be a great help uh, to the individual who we'd like to uh, to assist with this. Uh, also, if you have an old uh, pad or something, that's as well um, to help them. Um, you know, make their way through life. It's a, a little thing, and hopefully someone can help us with it. Call the office, and uh, we'll check that out and find out what needs to be done to make sure that that phone can be safely uh, transferred to, uh, to this person. So uh, just looking for that. That's our appeal. We're also uh, making a very, very earnest appeal, especially for the 5 o'clock Mass, uh, for someone uh, to act as my delegate to, do, um, uh, to, to check to see that people uh, who are involved in the Mass 
uh, the offering of the Mass, actually you're all involved in the Mass, but uh, those who are going to be reading, uh, acting as Eucharistic ministers or ushers to quickly see that they have either proof of vaccination or proof of a negative uh, uh, rapid test that's less than 24 hours old. And that's something that I, that I have to have. I have to see it or someone I've delegated whom I trust uh, can see that and then just let me know that yes, everyone's checked in and we're fine. Uh, the job basically is probably going to involve checking with the ushers and then coming up here and waiting for the Eucharistic minister and the lector to check in. And as I've, I've uh, said to folks, oh, and as well the cantor, um, our musician, because she's uh, a contractor, I, I'm, I'm trusted to check that one out well in advance, but, um, and, and that's just going to require also all the ministers of the liturgy, ushers, but also lectors and Eucharistic ministers to get here in good time so that we can see that and can proceed, uh, knowing that we're all, we've all met the policy of the diocese. So that's that. Uh, Synod of Bishops 2023, Th there's been reference to this. I don't know how many people are up to speed on this, this uh, rollout of the uh, synod that's to take place in two years was announced not that long ago by Pope Francis. Um, he, in a homily last weekend, uh, where they inaugurated the process for preparation for the synod at St. Peter's Basilica, uh, the Pope said, uh, celebrating a synod means walking on the same road, walking together. Let us look at Jesus. First he encounters the rich man on the road, he listens to his questions, and finally he helps him discern what he must do to, to inherit eternal life. Encounter, listen, and discern. I would like to reflect on these three verbs that will characterize the synod. So you can read the entire homily if you go to the diocesan website. The diocese is celebrating the opening of this process this weekend, uh, the synodal path, they're calling it, and that will be at a mass on Sunday at four o'clock. Um, in the coming weeks, the diocese synod committee will be sending to the parishes, to Catholic organizations, and other groups and institutions an outline of the process the diocese will follow to encourage the broadest possible participation in the consultation leading up to the Synod. We pray for God's blessing on this important initiative of Pope Francis and our own diocesan response. So if you're a little bewildered as to what this is all about, don't worry, the information is coming out. It's, it is, as I said, somewhat sudden in the life of the church to have something announced three or four months uh, in the past and then suddenly we're rolling it out, but we'll catch up. The other thing just to mention is, of course, uh, tomorrow afternoon, we're having special masses of First Communion for the children who ordinarily would have received uh, their First Communion last spring. It's a bit of a catch-up. They've been waiting such a long time, the dears. So please keep them in uh, your prayers uh, as they approach the Blessed Sacrament tomorrow. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God. Please join in singing 688. <clears throat>